Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So a lot of brothers, brothers and sisters have asked me um, that Imam Asif you should say something or you should record a message because masjid is locked down uh, for the inspiration for the spirituality uh, what should we do what should we not do why there is a fiqhi mess what is the spiritual lesson out of this and initially i was very hesitant because there are people who are more more eloquent um, more knowledgeable than me and they are already doing this mashallah i've heard that a lot of uh, imams and scholars have given their uh, uh, small messages during friday khutbah instead of friday khutbah from home um, so i thought that that will be sufficient but instead of repeating the same message um, i will I will try to answer some of these questions in this brief few minutes, inshallah, whatever I have. Um, uh, from, one from the spiritual angle, second from the fiqhi angle where we have seen a mess from last night. Um, and inshallah, I will try to have a balanced understanding so that inshallah, all of you are going to um, come up with uh, a balanced approach of how to deal with the Islamic law and fiqh. Uh, let's start with uh, with uh, the spiritual lesson um, in this coronavirus I have actually seen uh, two different extremes in Muslim community one is extreme panic and one is extreme carelessness um, and actually before that if you are not a Muslim then it makes sense why you are panic because this is the only life for you there is no life after this um, so there is every reason for you to be panic um, but if you are Muslim if you believe that this life is nothing uh, and there is a life after this which is eternal um, then obviously you need to take precaution obviously you need to come up with some preventive measures but at the same time at the end of the day we believe that eventually this world will end if not with coronavirus we will going to die with some other reason that is inevitable um, so uh, that that balance understanding that making an effort but then leaving up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatever he have destined for us that is a mu ideal Muslim approach which is missing subhanallah uh, from last few days uh, I have seen a Muslim com in Muslim community there are extreme panic subhanallah and what panic can do what, what is stress and anxiety panic can give the effects of that is far more worse than any contagious disease um, and then there are few people who are actually abusing the word tawakkul trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you ask them brother no, don't handshake don't uh, hug uh, stay away from certain group of people and you will going to see them that they would say no 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 if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us but we were going to live our life no that's not even the Islamic perspective uh, I just want to tell you two three ahadith which I actually initially originally prepared for khutbah and then I will try to answer uh, those fiqhi questions which um, uh, are coming every now and then so let's start with that this is not the first time when Muslim community is uh, facing this epidemic or pandemic now uh, because of um, uh, now is declared as pandemic. Um, but even if you go back to the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba, uh, the very first historic epidemic, the very first plague which affected Sahaba and which hit them hard, uh, came in Syria in Sham. And the books of history are filled. I'll just want to mention something very brief about this balance approach doing your effort and then leaving the trust to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that at that time Umar ibn al-Khattab was a Khalifa and this epidemic this plague was so monstrous that it took the life of more than 25,000 or more people and majority of the Sahaba Tabi'een students of Sahaba died in that area because of this plague Umar ibn al-Khattab along with his few companions from Medina they actually start walking towards Sham because they don't want to leave their their ummah that's a part of leadership subhanAllah to stay with the community at the time of hardship when they reach at the border of Syria when they reach at the border of Sham the delegates came al along with the leader there which is Abu Bada ibn al-Jarrah he was a Khalifa he was a leader at that time of Sham area so Abu, Abu, Abu Badr al-Jarrah said uh, by the way just remember this Abu Badr al-Jarrah is one of the Ashra Mubashara one of the kindest companion Rasulullah told him you are Amin of this Ummah just remember this information Umar ibn al-Khattab actually said about Abu Badr al-Jarrah that if there if Abu Badr al-Jarrah will be alive I will make him Khalifa after me can you imagine the status of Abu Badr al-Jarrah so he came out uh, of Sham to meet and to welcome Umar ibn Khattab and he said that Amir al Mumineen, the situation inside is extremely bad there is a plague there is a contagious deadly virus is spread we are dying it's better for you not to come inside 
because if you will come inside if you will die this is a disaster this is a recipe to disaster for the ummah right now so you should go back to Medina and then Umar radiallahu anh, obviously he was if you know personality of Umar radiallahu anh, he was not the person who would say okay I'm afraid and I'm going back he started taking advice he took advice three times one from Mahajir companions the next time he took from Ansar companions and then third he took the advice from the companions from Quraysh who migrated after uh, who accepted Islam and migrated after Fatih Makkah and all of them gave mixed advice this, had, this hadith is mentioned in Bukhari some of them says actually Umar radiallahu anh, you should go inside because distrust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we came here for a reason so go inside some of the other companions said no 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 Umar we should go back it's a disaster if something happened to you or to your companions and Umar radiallahu anh, after listening to all those uh, advices back and forth Umar said okay we are going back to Medina we are not going inside of Sham now why I'm telling you this, the moment when Umar made this decision radiallahu an, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, such a high status companion, he said this to Umar radiallahu an, he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, a firarum min qadr illah? Umar ibn al-Khattab, are you running away from the qadr of Allah? Are you running away from the decree of Allah? Are you running away from what Allah have ordained for you? It means, are you afraid of that Umar? Why are you not coming inside? And Umar radiallahu anh gave the most balanced response and that is why I'm telling you this story. Umar radiallahu anh said, Nafirru min qadrillah ila qadrillah. He says, yes Abu Bada, I am running away from the qadr of Allah to the qadr of Allah. I am running away from the qadr of Allah from what Allah have already ordained for me to what Allah have already ordained for me. It means I'll make my effort, but I'm not saying that I'll be saved there back in the Medina. If I have to die, I will die there. But I have to make efforts. It's my responsibility. This is the message subhanAllah. And by the way, when they were having this discussion, Abdurrahman ibn Auf came and he said that I actually uh, know one of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa about this. And Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Badr al-Jarrah, their habits, the habits of the companions was whenever there is hadith come, they would surrender themselves. They would say, okay, go ahead. What is the hadith? So Abdurrahman ibn Auf says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about this, if you heard about ta'un, if you heard about plague, contagious viral disease, spread in the area, Area. if you are outside of that area do not go inside and if you are in that area do not go outside so what Omar is saying actually uh, is reconciling with the revelation based on this Omar said alhamdulillah and this is not surprise if you have read the seerah of history of Omar radiallahu anh, that many times his opinions will be reconciling with the revelation subhanallah why I'm telling you this Islam asks us to be smart. Prophet Muhammad asks us to be smart. Tawakkul on Allah does not mean that we have to act in a foolish way. We have to tie our camel and then we have to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are so many ahadith subhanAllah where Rasulullah said, okay, do not put the uh, the healthy camels with the weak camels or with the uh, camels which are uh, not sound in terms of health. Uh, unhealthy camels, do not put them with the healthy camels. Uh, similarly, we can, we can engage this subhanallah that it's it's embedded in our sharia to take the preventive measures it's it's not tawakkul it's foolishness subhanallah if you are not doing whatever sharia is asking you to do and all these scholars almost all these scholars say the ilaj uh, treating yourself seeking treatment in general circumstances is it's at least sunnah if not wajib according to certain scholars so that is one thing which i would like to say that is part of our religion it's part of our religion next thing next thing the spiritual lesson out of it um, you know uh, first of all what did we learn from this um, this entire story um, some people ask me is this coronavirus COVID-19 back in the days we had Ebola now corona uh, COVID-19 is it punishment or is it uh, something as a mercy what it is what's the status of it and we don't have to reinvent the wheel Aisha asked the same question to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Sayyid Bukhari Aisha said Sa'altu Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam anit ta'un I asked Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about plague why this plague will come and as a contagious disease will take life of so many people why it happens so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave this response and this is actually one of the most balanced response subhanallah on this topic Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says annahu kana azaban that indeed it is a punishment 
And you might think, really, it's a punishment? But actually Rasulullah says, يَبْعَثُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَنْ يَشَاءُ Punishment only for those people whom Allah wants to punish. So, those bad people whom Allah wants to punish, Allah will punish them through these contagious disease. This is a hadith in Bukhari. But then Rasulullah says, فَجَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ رَحْمَةً لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And the same thing when it comes to believers practicing Muslim can be converted into mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Same thing when it goes to bad people, it will be punishment in the Sharia. Same thing when it goes to practicing Muslim, it will be considered as mercy. Now you might ask, person dying of COVID-19, let's say Muslim, may Allah protect all of us. Person dying of COVID-19, how we can say it's actually a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Death is coming, he's on that bed. Because Allah, Allah's Messenger وسلم, says he will get the reward of Shaheed if he will die, Mislu Shaheed if he will die through any contagious deadly disease. This is Hadith of Bukhari. And which better death it is than the death of Shahada? Subhanallah. Allahumma rzuqna shahada than peace be like Amin ya Rabb. Now, Rasulullah وسلم, put two conditions. He says if you die of plague or any contagious viral deadly disease, you will going to get death of shahada reward of shahada if you will fulfill these two conditions in the same hadith first condition is that you need to be sabiran you need to be patient when you are dying and then second you need to believe that this hardship came from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you know when you are dying out of contagious disease it's very easy to start believing that this actually disease came because I went in this gathering, I went in this masjid, actually that one brother who was sneezing before Juma or after Juma on my face, that was the responsible brother. Rasulullah says, no, if you are on that bed as a Muslim and you are patient and you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have it, uh, put this in your destiny, then you will get the reward of shahada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the death of shahada. Ameen ya Rabb. Uh, just few other things inshallah before we can end uh, you know one thing which uh, we realize from this that death is inevitable if you think oh no i'm most practicing muslim nothing will happen to me you are not more practicing than abu badad al jarrah what happened to him he actually died later on radiallahu anh, in the same plague because he stayed in the sham because of the hadith that you cannot come out of the land where you are where the plague came and there's so many companions who were in the sham syria died just because of this plague you and me we are not more pious and righteous than these great companions if they can die in this contagious viral deadly disease then who are we so whether you are practicing muslim or non-practicing muslim regardless of your faith even if death will have to come, it have to come. But obviously, we have to take preventive measures. But subhanAllah, one thing we learned that death is inevitable. If you won't die with coronavirus, you will die eventually with something else. You know, right now, as I'm speaking, almost 40, 50 cases of death uh, have been recorded in US. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us the ability to stop at this number. Ameen Ya Rab. There's so much chaos in the US right now. Economy is trumbling, stock market is crashing because there is 40, 50 that is high, really high numbers. You know what? Every single day in America, there are more than 200 people die out of, out of diabetes. Every single day. And you might ask where I'm bringing this from? Check CDC website every single day so if you are not dying with this you might die with something else eventually that is inevitable the most undeniable fact i'm not asking you to become again okay fool we don't have to do anything no you have to do you have to make sure you prevent you have to make sure you don't go into the large gatherings you have to make sure you stay away from the people the sneezing coughing so on and so forth but just have that balanced approach after making an effort leaving the trust up to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um one, one, just last two things before we can go to the fiqh argument. What is the spiritual lesson we learn from this? You know, if um, Massachusetts, I guess, is the third or fourth state where the outbreak have happened and in the last two, three days, the numbers have increased drastically, subhanAllah. And may Allah protect all of us. Ameen, Ya Rab. So, there is an outbreak. Yesterday, our uh, uh, mayor also announced there is an emergency. Two days before, governor announced the entire Massachusetts state of emergency. There is an outbreak of uh, coronavirus. Every person you talk to is worried. Now, this is a time when you will see people, subhanAllah, they will 
come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you are a party animal, you will become a decent person at this time. You will try to say, oh Allah, please forgive me. Please forgive me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a time. Unless your heart is sealed, that you cannot even feel anything, even at this stage. If this is your situation right now, that you came close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of this outbreak, because of the news, then this is actually good for you. Because Ibn Taymiyyah says, Al Musiba tuqbal biha Allah, khayru laka min al ni'mat and seek azikar Allah. That the Musiba, the hardship, the calamity, the disease which brings you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far more better in the sight of Allah than the favor of Allah which distracts you. Favor of Allah is distracting you? Not good. But the Musiba, a calamity which brings you close to Allah, that's extremely good. Um, so now the last thing and by the way some people say oh this is selfish attitude I have seen some atheists will say no 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 when you are having, struggling you will come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nowhere in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is selfish attitude instead Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have encouraged us when you have any hardship actually go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Rasulullah sallam had any trouble or hardship he would go back to the prayers so it's absolutely fine actually recommended when you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most you'll go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes what is criticized in the Quran after the situation has become calm you will forget that situation you'll go back into your regular life so if you are coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are doing dhikr askar in the morning in the evening just don't leave that once the situation will become normal and you will be safe inshallah because Allah is the one who have actually given you the safety last thing inshallah is this actually tells us about the humbleness also you know it's it's, it's very interesting this is small virus this virus is so small you cannot even see from your eyes you cannot even see from your eyes you need a microscope and anyway, you need to zoom in this is small virus is creating chaos in the entire world more than 110 countries is being affected or directly impacted with this virus. Can you imagine this subhanallah? And you cannot even see this subhanallah. See with the bug, with the fly, they are so tiny but at least you can see them. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us our reality. You know many times I have seen subhanallah, uh, there are people um, who are atheists, they would say agnos, that uh, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. Really? <laughs> Science will need at least 12 to 18 months to come up with simple vaccine for this. They couldn't even identify their different theory scientists are coming. Sometimes they would say it came out of a snake, it came out of bed, so on so forth. It's still struggling. And such a small thing, such a small thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends these things to give us a lesson. That even though we are advanced, but we are so dependent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, give us the ability to understand this in a proper context, inshallah. Now, just fiqhi questions, I want to um, answer this. We have Brother Hanan in the room. Brother Hanan, can you ask those questions? Why the, there was a mess nationwide in cancelling the Juma Khutbah? Some Masjid did cancel and some did not. So people are confused about it. Okay. The fiqhi opinion around it. And so, so Brother Hanan have asked the question that... Um, um, why there was a mess last night throughout the country means we are talking about America and I mean for, we are from Massachusetts throughout the country there was a mess um, that should we have Juma Khutbah should we not have Juma Khutbah and some people some masajid had Juma Khutbah some masajid cancelled Juma Khutbah and then there was an uproar in the community social media pundits and muftis came out and give fatawa and takfir and the same same old drama um, why there was that situation what's the correct answer so you need to understand um, from from different angles so generally speaking when you first of all if you have not studied fiqh or sharia then it's hard for you to understand this all these different opinions because it's really hard um, but let's start with this so i will give you a medical example then we will come to this so three four years ago i had the surgery of my cheekbone my cheekbone went inside playing cricket um, and uh, I went to two maxillofacial surgeon um, and one of them said that to pull this cheekbone up we need to cut from here your right cheek and we need to pull it up I was scared because there will be scar uh, marks then other maxillofacial surgeon he says no we can avoid that by uh, trimming your hairs from here and cutting it from here and just pulling it uh, completely without leaving any marks so you don't have to do another plastic surgery for that uh, basically there are two different opinions 
instead of seeing who is right who is wrong they both will reach to conclusion i found the easy one um, i said okay this one makes although this is a longer route but it will uh, avoid me to do one second surgery uh, so i basically took benefit from these flexibility of these two qualified extremely qualified scholars and both of them have argument that we are right and maybe other person might not be right but as, at the end of the day as a patient i took what is best for me similarly when you see scholars are having disagreement instead of thinking one is right other person is wrong if you are not qualified in the sharia and fiqh just keep following your local imam if there are multiple local imams who are knowledgeable and whom you trust and they both disagree then follow the easy option because rasulullah sallallahu sallam whenever he was given two options he would select ikhtiyara he would select the easy one now when it comes to fiqh of jumma and why it was a big mess so you have to understand see uh, first of all why it was a big decision for the masajid to cancel or not to cancel the jumma khutbah it's different for an individual who is coming for jumma khutbah and to cancelling from a masajid administration perspective there are two different angles people are calling me that okay rasulullah sallam give permission when it's raining when it's muddy road you don't have to go for salah and for juma that's different thing for an individual if you have any reason you don't need to come for friday khutbah if you are sick you don't need to come if you have a fear of getting sick you don't need to come um, if um, uh, you are traveling you don't need to come if you if, if, if there is a strong weather inclement you don't need to come but that individual obligation is removed does that apply at the communal obligation that's a big decision so from a masajid perspective to cancel the juma khutbah it's little less flexible when it comes to comparing with the individual so for individual we advise it's it's very easy if there is any reason you are afraid of the harm do not come but should we cancel it that's where the entire debate happened and the reason where ulama have used that okay if this reason happened then we can cancel is actually the uh, reason of if there is a legitimate need in the sharia and need will be defined with if there is a widespread hardship if everyone or majority of people in the community is struggling that's a movement a widespread hardship then we can cancel the juma khutbah so how does that calculate i'm not giving you the fiqh lesson but just in a very simple language if the reason is real not assumed if the real is if the reason is real haqiqi not assumed zunni, then you can change the principle then you can change the uh, cancel the khutbah uh, how it will be manifest in our times some scholar said that okay if the local city officials ask you not to have the gatherings then it's enough then it's a real need if the medical doctor team um, some scholars say muslim some say if it's not muslim it should be upright doctors if the team says oh it's very harmful you should not have then you should not have and that's where the discussion happened because some masajid cancel even though their local city official said it's not mandatory but it's recommended not to have big gatherings so they said no when you can go to school when you can go to the churches and we found out people are going to synagogues why can you come to the masjid for juma for 10 15 minute khutbah uh, the other side will say no 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 they are recommending and uh, from the medical perspective is really harmful so cancel it so there's this back and forth back and forth discussion um, uh, even if you have mandated that okay let's say 250 people or more should not gather then the other argument will come okay let's decrease his juma size let's make it 100 100 100 then there's back and forth argument so there will be no one answer because this is a new issue this is a coronavirus new issue and you are talking about Thursday night, Friday's Juma, telling the entire community, uh, which uh, is uneducated most for the most part in fiqh. So some scholars went, okay, um, this constitute a legitimate need that okay, everyone have a fear of harm of a deadly virus, so cancel it. So even they did a right job, and you know that our Masjid and Muslim Islamic Center, we have a gathering of thousand people, so we could not take this risk from medical doctor from other places. We got this call. He said, okay, we are canceling it. The some other masajid maybe their congregation is small and they felt safe and they uh, took preventive measures by telling the community if you are sick you should not come and we should have a small gathering if they did it that's their ishtihad may Allah reward them and may Allah keep them safe inshallah 
do not make a big deal just keep following your community um, and do not become that social media Facebook mufti because eventually that's a recipe to disaster keep following your local imams if there are multiple imams in your community then follow the easy option inshallah that's it yes do you have any other question fake question so continuing on that topic the question came in like you can make a smaller groups and you can pray the Juma. so the question will come because it's not looks like it's not gonna end soon may Allah protect all of us I mean can we do in a small gathering maybe even a home if yes how many people should be there for yeah you? so this is actually the related question that okay if you are not coming to masjid masjid called off for khutbah uh, like in I'm, I'm i'm assuming in the Worcester area no masjid had even the other masjid cancelled it so where should we pray should we pray at home zohar salah which in general circumstances if you're not praying juma you'll pray zohar as a traveler or or you will going to have gathering of juma salah other than masjid maybe at work maybe in home some other place in your shop now this is a big disagreement big disagreement first of all is it possible for us to have juma salah in our homes one group of scholars say one group of scholars say that if there is a need like your masajid are not having the juma khutbah or you don't have any masjid in in the surrounding area very close by one group of scholars say then if you have the quorum if you have the quorum uh, for the juma khutbah i will tell what does the quorum means then you can have juma khutbah even in your home and the quorum will disagree based on which school of thought you are following for the Hanbali and for the Shafri's the quorum is 40 people 40 men that you need to have 40 men at least if not more obviously women and kids and all those people can join but you need to have 40 men because it's obligatory on men it's not obligatory on women and the kids it's recommended for them so they would say Hanbali and Shafri you need to have 40 men if you have 40 men at your home then you can uh, pray Juma Salah uh, at your home um, for Malikis for Malikis they say at least 12 if not more now they have different evidence Hanafi Hamli and Shafi uses the evidence from Abu Dawud Malikis use the evidence that okay Rasulullah was giving khutbah all of a sudden some Sahaba went out when Surah Jumu'ah were, were revealed and only 12 were sitting in front so Imam Malik extracted that you can have the khutbah from the 12 not less than 12 um, so 12 men at least have to be there for the valid khutbah so if you have 12 people and men in your family adult they uh, it will be legitimate uh, Jumu'ah khutbah Hanafi says there are two opinions in the Hanafi fiqh authorized position is one imam and three musallis one imam and three musallis this is imam abu hanifa and imam zufar or a student of abu hanafi so if you have basically this quorum you can have juma at your home uh, non-authorized position in hanafi fiqh uh, muhammad al hasan shaybani and abu yusuf his students they would say no one imam with two people so basically three people that you can actually have uh, juma khutbah with these three individual at your home uh, there is one other opinion which is not endorsed by any mazhab ibn hazm ibn hazm says one imam and one other man that's it two people from jama'ah this is one opinion this is one opinion the other side of the aisle say the other this is by the way quorum the other side of the aisle say that no you cannot pray juma at home when juma is called off in the masjid the purpose of the juma is gathering um if you are not praying juma at home then just pray zohar because you are killing the purpose you're killing the purposes pray zohar for raka you are not bound by any sharia to pray juma so there's back and forth discussion i would say whatever your heart feels better safe inshallah do that because you have legitimate scholars on both sides instead of reinventing the wheel see we cannot fix the issue in 2020 or the issues which are coming for last 1300 years in our islamic history just accept this as a reality and do whatever is good for you inshallah and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite our hearts inshallah any other question brother hanan yeah, that's more important and may Allah protect all I mean, the I mean. and Muslims and non-Muslims, all everyone in the United States and around the world. Uh, there are multiple videos around the Facebook chat and as you said, like now the media is open in the hands of people. Hmm. For the burial of the person who is died yeah. in any disease which is epidemic of pandemic. Yeah, so how to do 
basically washing what are the uh, yeah. yeah maybe in some cases doctor may say no you cannot yeah you because of uh, contagiousness so let's start with washing shrouding and funeral prayer uh, so generally speaking there's a rule of thumb before we can go to these special cases like coronavirus it's an obligation on the muslim community to do the washing uh, starting with family if family is not doing that muslim community to do the washing to do the burial to do the funeral prayer may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us i mean ya rab um, but if Muslim, uh, if there is a legitimate need, I'll tell you what it is, maybe medical need or some other need, then it's okay if someone else do the washing and shrouding. But generally speaking, Muslims should do according to majority of these scholars. So let's start with the washing. So we know the traditional way of washing the deceased. Um, uh, but let's say if a person have died with coronavirus, and you need to check medical doctors because uh, I have spoke to a few medical doctors and they said that actually the body is still contains the virus which can affect uh, whoever will going to uh, touch that person. So you need to follow certain protocol. If you can after following that protocol and after wearing that outfit and whatever they will give if they allow you now you can give the ghusl and washing and now you won't be harmed then it's uh, then it's your responsibility then you have to do it but let's say if they will say no still you can get harmed let us do or still they will say no um, uh, you cannot give the entire detail washing to this because it will harm you then you can do the bare minimum the bare minimum is pour the water over the deceased once that's it that's a bare minimum obligation even if that will in this case it looks like if medical doctor says no even that will be harmful then ibn qudama rahimahullah says that actually you can do tayammum like if a body is decomposed we know that you don't have to give ghusl you can if ghusl is not possible you can do tayammum if tayammum will create harm if tayammum will create harm then you can skip the washing then you can skip the washing because at the end of the day we don't want a person to get harmed because rasulullah says la darara wa la dirara there is no harm in islam or no reciprocating harm so that's one thing you can skip this obligation if these steps were going to harm the person who's washing second shrouding shrouding also we have to do it in a pres prescribed way um, uh, as by these scholars following your whatever school of thought you're following whether for men or for women but if this person died because of coronavirus covid19 may Allah protect all of us then um, there are chances if medical doctor or any credible source will sell, tell you that you might you might get harm if you will shroud this body so ask them if they can actually shroud for us if not possible if they will tell we have to do our process we have to put this and that and seal and plastic bag and everything if there is a potential harm in not doing that and just by putting shroud then let them do whatever they are doing because again advice of medical doctors and credible source is legitimate here you don't want to harm yourself for the community then skip the shrouding also or maybe you can shroud after they will put in the plastic bag and if that's possible if that's possible third if they say no we cannot bring it quickly to the masjid because that will create the environment that's okay that's okay all these scholars except majority of the uh, scholars majority of these scholars they say that it's okay to pray salatul janaza in cemetery while the body is in the grave that the majority say it's okay although generally it's recommended bodies in front you're praying in the masjid or praying outside of the masjid according to hanafi maliki but in this case it's okay if they will bury immediately immediately after the shrouding they would put the body in the grave and you can pray while the body is in the grave that's okay and the hadith is very obvious when rasulullah sallam prayed for that woman who was cleaning the masjid all of a sudden she died and rasulullah found out and he went to the cemetery and prayed for her so what a beautiful beautiful incident subhanallah she was cleaning the masjid can you imagine how beautiful it is uh, in the sight of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clean the masjid um so some scholars say it have to you have to pray before the 30 days will pass because after 30 days uh, the body will decompose and some scholars say based on the culture uh, you can define the number of days uh, but again this is how you will do it so again uh, coordinate with your local um, officials coordinate with your medical doctors take their advice because this is problem regarding to medicine so if you have studied only sharia and not medicine uh, then don't try to act that you know everything like jack of all you have have to be dependent on the advice of the medical doctors uh, and may Allah protect all of us inshallah and I'll just end on this inshallah that 
for for last last until from last night i have said i have seen so many conference calls different organizations who used to fight together they will work together they would say okay now we need to work together because it's an epidemic because it's a pandemic and so on and so forth even democrats and republicans they were fighting but now they are actually in some line they are saying okay let's let's make a plan together how to cope up with this how to tackle this i'm asking you one question why we need a disease disaster pandemic epidemic to unite us means are we waiting for a disastrous situation so that we can sit together and solve the problems of community why can't we do this when times are good that's that's the issue subhanallah why we have to be reactive that when something really bad will happen and then we have to sit in one room and okay let's discuss what's on the table why we can do this when things are good may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us out of the survival mode so that we can think from a successful mode inshallah ta'ala may Allah protect all of us our families and those people who have passed away in the Muslim community may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them shahada and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the entire community and the entire ummah ameen ya rab jazakumullahu khairan assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh <coughs>